my talk, like he said, it's called Services and Rails and the shit they don't tell you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how Yammer builds services alongside Rails, and then talk about some of the things we don't talk about often. Um, so this is me. My name's Brian. Um, I work on the Rails team at Yammer. Um, and one of the things that Rails team does is help extract out chunks of functionality that are in our, uh, into services that are in our Rails code base, um, and then integrate those back into Rails. Um, I also love Zelda and music and Ruby and Yammer. Maybe I can talk closer. Does that help at all? Check. Good. Awesome. Um, so first, um, I kind of have a little pet peeve about uh, titles of talks, so I'm going to try and address that. Um, it, it, I like when, or I don't like when talks have a title and then they don't really get to the gimmicky part of the title. And so my gimmick is the shit they don't tell you. So I want to make sure I address that today. Um, and then, like they said earlier, this is. My first conference talk uh, was a week ago, so I'm kind of new to this. Um, really excited but scared right now, but awesome. Um, so when I started putting this thing together, I had to kind of think back to the last time I'd spoken in front of a class or something. Um, and I remembered something that was really important then was like which template I was going to use for my talk. Um, and so Yammer now is part of Microsoft, so we have all these templates. Um, and so I, I used this template to put this together, and I found this slide in one of them. And I thought it was kind of cool. It said, full bleed photos. Pictures can set a mood or evoke emotion, making for a more memorable presentation. So I really like this. Um, I dragged this over to my presentation. And I thought I could attach these two things, um, my pet peeve about titles. Um, and so I can address the issue of every time there's some shit that we don't talk about, this guy's going to come on screen and help like point out these things. So you'll be seeing this guy a lot. Here we go. Here he is. So this might not apply to you yet. None of this talk might apply to you yet. It's, it's cool stuff to think about, but if you're building a startup to determine viability, you might want to ignore some of this and just get it done. Um, you're going to add a lot of extra complexity with all of this, and you probably don't have enough information yet. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you don't have to write clean, well-designed code. It's just hard to think about services at this point. And if you have clean code, extracting that into services is going to be a lot easier for you. Um, and then once you know you need to build services and scale, you're going to have to do some things that are a bit uncomfortable. So with that said, let's continue. At Yammer, we have a huge fucking Rails app. Um, it has 300 plus models. Some of them are pretty big. We have 200 controllers, a lot of shit in our lib directory. Um, this thing is backed by 20 plus JVM services that we've built. Um, and some of those services do over a billion requests a day. So um, we have a pretty big uh, ecosphere here. But at the end of the day, we still have this huge Rails app, and we still have to deal with that. Um, and this gets harder as we go. We've largely been okay with this. Um, but we've been able to address this through chipping away building services. But things are still really painful when you get into things like sharding, or upgrading Rails, or upgrading Ruby. These things turn into all or nothing projects at this point, and, and it gets difficult. So we're going to talk about service-oriented architectures. Um, why build services? What does it get us? Um, and this is, this is kind of the first goal of that. We want these components that scale individually. Um, when you have these small focused services, they're more versatile and allow for, for easier reusability, things like that. Um, so let's talk about reusability. We have our Rails app, and we have a couple other services here. Um, this is with some of our prior search stack experience. We're able to separate, some, separate out some of the different pieces of our search stack. Uh, in the middle, Flattery, this is a denormalized store of data that uh, is in Rails. So we have some, some hooks in Rails that when things get published, we publish them over to Flattery so we can store a denormalized representation of them. Um, and then Dexy there, kind of to the right, um, is our service that builds Lucene indexes from transaction streams from Flattery. And then ultimately, we have our search interface. Um, so when we wanted to add another search service to the stack, it was relatively easy for us. Um, we built this autocomplete service called Completey. It kind of hooked up to the same pipeline here. Um, and we had the pieces in place already and some clean interfaces to find. Um, same goes with exporting data. We have a service called Slurpee. Um, part of this pipeline already existed. We didn't have to go to Rails again for this data. Um, we already had access to it in this other service. And this is great because we have all these different pieces now. These can scale independently. And so it's much easier for us to scale out a service. If we have these, these pieces broken up, we can, we can scale them individually. 
we have a much better idea of each service's specific needs and its performance patterns. We can, we can chart these things. And we don't have to throw resources at the whole stack um, where they may or may not be needed. And so all of this is kind of enabled through another benefit, which is this loose coupling of things. We, we have these smaller and more focused, focused services. We've encapsulated a lot of our concerns. We can push out updates independently to each of these services. We don't have to have these huge deploys. We still do for our Rails app, but we can push out little pieces of the, of the infrastructure in other ways. And, and mostly, we can change out everything without telling anyone. Um, entire technologies, entire libraries, platforms. Um, granted, we have to keep the interfaces the same, um, but that's a problem we can deal with uh, a little differently. And so the, the start there is that we're currently in the process of switching out our files back end. It's been a little painful. We've had to make more changes than we thought. And that probably means we fucked some things up when we did it the first time. But we're addressing those things now. And uh, largely, we can swap out this entire service for, our, for a new one. And so the second goal of service-oriented architectures is maintaining these code bases that will scale across your organization. Um, if you've worked in a monolithic app before, you've probably run into things like stepping on other people or having to maintain a lot of this application knowledge in your head, um, just knowing how this whole thing works. And some of the win of services is that you don't have to. You can have all these different black boxes um, that do these specific tasks, and then you can learn about them as you, get, as you need to uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And so that gives us this notion of distributed execution. This is enabled by these loose coupling of things. Um, and this isn't in the computing sense, but like in the development sense. Uh, be because we've divided up our code bases, it's easier, us for, easier for us to assign a team to the service, and a team to the client, and they can coordinate and, and agree on how these things are going to talk to each other. One of the things we do pretty often is we build dummy components. So in the beginning of building a service and integrating it, we'll, we'll do the Rails side that sends some data that's not real yet, and we'll do the, the integration on the service side where it's accepting data but not doing anything with it yet. And then as we continue to iterate on this and get closer to the end, we'll have this full end-to-end -end test, but we can still unblock each other and build this thing out um, and make changes as we go along as well. So here's our dude again. Um, this doesn't happen overnight, um, as I kind of alluded to a little while ago. Again, when you're starting your application or startup, this is all a lot of additional complexity that prevents you from shipping product quickly, kind of our goal. Um, with a single undivided code base, you have the freedom to change things really quickly. Um, you can access data layers directly. You can share a lot of code easily and avoid some of this overhead that, manages, uh, that managing services entails. Granted, some of that might come back to bite us later, um, but we can move quickly forward. And there are a lot of things you're going to learn as you're iteratively moving this way. Um, you're not just going to wake up one morning with services. And we found at Yammer that, that a lot of this even requires some organizational change. And so at Yammer, we talk a lot about Conway's Law. And kind of the, the goal of this is that organizations that are optimized to avoid bottlenecks will create code that is meant to avoid bottlenecks. And so this is what the law says. It says, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And so it's hard to think about services if we don't think about our development teams in the same way. A lot of organizations will divide um, their departments vertically or horizontally, which can lead to silos within the organization um, of people working on the same thing day to day. Um, this barrier may also cause people to get attached to their turf. And it just ultimately inhibits communication and decision making from our experience. And so here's an example of that. Early on at Yammer, we had the messaging team. We had Rails. We had the service. Um, and this is a service that handed all of our message feeds. And this team supported that. And this is what their responsibility looked like. They managed the service. They managed the Rails side. They, they managed both sides of this implementation. And so they decided on the interface. That they decided how to implement this thing. They had a really siloed knowledge of the, of the whole system. It's not necessarily the most important thing that they could be working on at all times. And then how do we scale this? Do we keep creating these feature teams? Um, how do we address that? And so we, we took a different approach something that might scale better organizationally. And this is what we have right now. This is kind of what we've come up with. Um, this is what it looks like. We have our Rails team and our core services team. And the Rails team is largely responsible for what goes on in the Rails app, and core services the other way. Um, all of our code bases at Yammer are open. So if you're on the Rails team, it doesn't mean you always have to be writing Ruby code. And if you're on the 
and vice versa. Um, so we have a Rails team that would take care of these implementations. Um, yeah, the, the Rails team still has to know a lot about how this monolithic Rails app works. It's still a bottleneck for us. But the idea that we could iter iteratively move things into services and reduce the amount of knowledge on the Rails side uh, seemed like a pretty good win for us. But we also needed to take this a step further. And so we have this notion of cross-functional teams. So when we start building a new service or feature at Yammer, we put together one of these cross-functional teams um, with representatives from every aspect of the project. We bring in basically two to 10 people from whatever functional teams are, are needed, and they work on a project for anywhere from two to 10 weeks. Um, people, this way, people are constantly working on new and different things um, with new teams of people. Um, and to Sarah's point about working on new projects with new people, we've seen some of these same things. Um, this is how we address it. Um, granted, we don't do consulting work, and so our domain doesn't change, but we still have lots of different problems that we're trying to solve. We have infrastructure projects, we have developer tools, um, we have core product features, we have more maybe tailored backend work, things to extract from the services, um, addressing tech debt. We also have like an analytics team that builds tools for our data pipeline. Uh, sometimes these tools and features come full circle with product engineering as well. So while we do have these functional teams, we basically have this pool of engineers that can work on a wide range of problems. You can work on all these different things. And so here's kind of a, an example of what a cross-functional team would look like. Um, we would bring in two Rails engineers if the project warranted it. We'd bring in a core services engineer, maybe a mobile client engineer, and then some other things outside of, en of engineering. Um, and so this creates this autonomous, like well-informed, decentralized design process. This team comes together. They have this great discretion that ultimately yields these well-designed, isolated, reusable systems. And the key here is that these teams are ephemeral. They come together, they solve the problem, and then each team ever moves on to a new project. Um, another another kind of cool point here is any one of these people will be a, a tech lead on the project. And so we don't have like a manager that is always managing these teams. One person will be in charge for one project and kind of make sure things come together. They'll write some code as well. And then the next project, there'll be more of an indiv individual contributor role. And so we can constantly keep this moving around and kind of give people like the full um, view. And so again, these cross-functional teams, they spin up, they have to learn whatever domain they're gonna be in, and then they'll take adva advantage of this distributed execution to start working on these things, and they'll coordinate on the API between the services and client. And as a result of this, we have these naturally recurring services that whenever a cross-functional team comes together, we're, we're gonna have this. So this does have trade-offs as well. Um, these are some of the things that, that we've come across and mostly are okay with. But we do have some costs with not having siloed experts across the application. Um, some might argue that this is a benefit, but there is definitely a cost that's involved with teams constantly having to learn a new domain. We're mostly okay with this. Um, the second one we've been talking about a lot more recently is being careful not to couple the API implementation to the client. Um, as our mobile clients become smarter and they need more customized data, um, we're gonna have to address this more and more. And it, if we're thinking about projects like in a feature sense, um, we have to be careful that we're, that we're keeping these things decoupled. And we're looking into how other people have solved this right now. It's, it's um, a pretty hot topic for us. And then after the project's completed, we still have to support this feature. So that team's disbanded, the product's shipped, and then a couple bugs come up. Um, we still have to address that. Uh, we do it through a cross-functional team uh, that's a support engineering team. And so they'll come together, two to 10 people, two to 10 weeks, um, and address those kinds of issues. Um, it's a little bit more difficult because they don't know the domain, they don't know the, the code that was written. Um, but again, that's a trade-off that we're making here. So here we go, there's more than one way to do this. These are some of the, the ways it could look. Um, it's going to probably look like this for a while, put them all behind rails. We did change our organization, organizational structure, but these are still hard problems to solve. One of the easiest solutions is this, um, put it behind rails, don't let clients talk to them directly, or browsers rather, um, and this gets us some good partial win, but we still have to use rails resources to get to these services, so trade off. 
eventually we'll want to get to this and not have to be shackled to Rails for services. Um, and we'll want the browser to talk directly to a service. And sometimes this is easy. Um, we have a service called Mugshot that handles dynamically resizing and caching avatars and other images for us. And it works well because this has very little state. It has a very focused concern. And the browser can talk directly to it um, and handle it that way. But most of the time, when you want to go this route, you're going to have to figure out things like authentication. Um, other problems start to arise. And so there are lots of different ways to do this. There'll probably come a point when you want to work around Rails to get to some of your data that, that's stored behind Rails. And so reading from the database, it's not the worst thing in the world. But it's not, not great either to, to read from your, your Rails database, your Postgres database. And then writing to that database can be a nightmare. The problem with reading is that Postgres is in our database. Memcache is our database. Rails knows about our caching layer, but our services largely don't. And so we come across this a lot. Active Record holds our data hostage. And that's fine. It made quite a few things easy for us when we built our app. But now as we start to tear down some of the code that works well, our monolith, and pull it into services, we have to start to address this concern. And don't get me wrong, Active Record is awesome. Um, it lets you do a lot of cool stuff. You get these callbacks and hooks. You get validations. You, get, you can hook up state machines relatively easily. Um, we can tie in our cache val invalidation stuff. Um, we, we use a gem called Record Cache that allows us to store all of our records in memcache, handles a lot of the invalidation and stuff for us. And so we hardly ever hit the database. We rely pretty heavily on this. So all this stuff is awesome until you have to detangle this data and either access it from a service or try and move it out, out to the service. And then it turns into this. Ugh, active record. We have all these callbacks and hooks that we have to deal with, we have these validations that we have to deal with, state machines, we have to, to, to move that business logic. And, and we have to deal with cache invalidation. And so we have some options. One is ultimately don't use active record. Uh, some companies do that. We use it pretty heavily, so um, that's not really a route that we've taken. A lot of times, we'll end up using our services as indexes and just kind of store the IDs, store relationships. Um, and so what this means is, is our services have all these ideas, but we still have to get the data from Rails. So the, the, the Rails will talk to the service, get the IDs, and then hydrate these relationships. And so we get a lot of win out of that. Um, and so one of the things we're toying with recently is moving a lot of the data so the service owns it. Um, we're calling them bodega services, where when you need this, this vegetable thing, you go to the vegetable bodega and get it. Um, and we can hide away a lot of our sharding and caching implementations behind this. And kind of our goal is to make this service about as, ha as fast as hitting memcache, which is, is um, going to be difficult. And so once we talk about moving data, it basically means we're going to be duplicating data. Um, the chances are, if you're like us, you can't have downtime to move your data. Um, and then what if the service doesn't work like you intended it to? What, what, what are you going to do about that? Rolling back is really hard. Um, but you need a backup plan. And so ultimately, what we go to is double dispatching. We'll backfill all the, all the data to the service. We'll write the data to the database and post it to the service. And while we're doing all this, we can, we can monitor the service. We can profile it. We can kind of see how it's going to react. And then we can start to move to the service incrementally. Um, we can start to move part of our traffic, make sure things are going smoothly. We still have kind of an escape route. Um, but we're moving towards like moving this whole thing to the service. And the backfill is really cool because it's kind of a peek into our scalability. Um, you're going to be putting a lot more data in the service much faster than the service is typically, typically going to handle. And so we can use this to plan capacity and just expect how, how this thing's going to perform. And so now that we've done this, we have another problem. We have duplicate data. And so who cleans this up? How do we get it cleaned up? Um, we need to do it pretty quickly because developers are going to become confused. And we fuck this up from time to time. Data sticks around. It's really confusing. Um, and this is part of the trade-off maybe with our cross-functional teams that we disband, this thing's shipped, and now we still need to clean up this data. Um, we have ways that we address it, but it does go um, much longer than we'd like it to from time to time. And so ultimately, we need to know that we're OK with going all in. And the problem with this is that the old way is really comfortable. We have to be OK with breaking our comfort zone and dealing with these new issues 
instead of being able to just jump back to safety. Um, don't get me wrong, you don't want to strand yourself. You, you should have a, a backup plan. Um, and there should be this incremental period, um, but you've got to make the call eventually to completely switch. There's a cost with maintaining this backup plan, and eventually there's a point where it's not worth maintaining anymore. It's just kind of causing confusion, taking up time, taking up resources, um, and so kind of getting out of our comfort zone here. And on that note, we want to make shit easy for our developers. Um, if you don't have a good story for your development environment, you're not going to be able to continue to move quickly. And like I said earlier, part of the big win of services is not having to worry about things like configuring them or, or how they work until you need to dig into them. Um, it, if this isn't easy, developers might just wander back into their comfort zone. So basically what I'm saying is use Vagrant. Um, we use this. It's, it's really awesome. Um, for our development environment, we try and keep it really close to production. We run Ubuntu on Vagrant, um, and we also run Ubuntu in production. We can get all these services running locally. Um, this does start to become a problem when you have 20 plus JVM services, and your laptop can only have a max of 16 gigs of RAM, um, and, and the OS still has to run out on it. So we're, we're running into that. We're still trying to solve these issues. Um, and then we have to keep up with these services that are rapidly changing. Um, developers are going to have to keep these things up, up to date and not want to worry about that. We have this um, tool that we've built that runs inside Vagrant that we call Soup Kitchen. And it's a way for our developers to update all these services. It lets me go in here, update them so things work fine. But aside from that, largely I don't care about them. Um, they just work. They let me get my shit done. When things turn red, I click update. Here I clearly have not done that. And so this other thing we have to worry about with getting services to um, developers is we also have to deploy these things. And so we need a system that allows us to add new services quickly. Um, it's, we need to make it easy to deploy each of these services. And then we also need to maintain stable and pre-release packages because stable goes to production. And then developers are going to need to work on like, the, the latest master package. And so we have quite a few apps. And we need any engineer to be able to roll these things out. This is our, our one-click deplo deploy tool that we've built. We call it Deploymacy. Um, unfortunately, we haven't open sourced it yet. Uh, we talk about it from time to time, and there's some things that I'm trying to work on to get it open sourced. But it's pretty coupled to a lot of our conventions. And so we want to, but it's a lot of work. It's really hard. And so it allows any en engineer to effortlessly add new services for deployment. Another thing we need to start thinking about, or you should have been thinking about already, but think about on a wider scale, on, on 20 applications versus one application, is all this monitoring and alerting. You have to know the performance of all these different services now. Um, you have to plan capacity across all these different services to worry about things like QDEFs across um, how these services are reacting. And then you need to worry about like reachability from all these dependent clients. Um, there are a lot of different tools for this. Um, we do use New Relic. We get a lot of win out of that. Um, for monitoring, we use Ganglia. Um, and we have some other charting stuff we've built in-house to help us with this. And so with all of that, one of the, the big things that, that you need are these standardized tools. Um, not only all those tools, but things like uh, across all these services, you, you probably want the same response formats, the same data protocol, the same monitoring interfaces, deployment stories, um, dependency management. Um, all these things are going to make your world infinitely easier than trying to manage all of these like, unique and special snowflakes that all speak different languages. And so the way we build services at Yammer, we, we put this thing together called DropWizard. Um, Codahail maintains it. You can go to dropwizard.codahail.com to find more, out, more about it. Um, but it's basically we've packaged together all the Java libraries that we use when we're building one of these services in Java. And we get this really simple production-ready service that at the start, it's monitoring, it's alerting, um, it's reporting metrics. And this doesn't mean that you have to use Java necessarily. This is some of the, the choices we've made. Um, but we haven't necessarily discounted Ruby for, for doing these services either. Um, we talked about these bodega services a little bit. And we're talking about the possibility now is how, how do we get this, this service extracted out of the Rails app to hide all the data behind it? And maybe a lot of the win is getting this service into Ruby first, detangle the data, get it into Ruby, and then figure out where we need to go from there. Maybe if we do 
um, need to get more, more performance out of it or some other concern that we have, then we can move it to Java, do something else with it. But we can stop at Ruby and we can figure out that problem first and then figure out these other problems. And so service-oriented architectures have trade-offs as well. Um, there's a lot of good things that we get, but there are also some new things we have to think about. One of these being that complex systems fail. Um, you need to start thinking about degrading for unavailable services now. You're going to be chasing issues through these multiple levels of indirection. Um, people don't know where the problem's happening. Uh, the place that's throwing the alert might not be actually causing the issue. Um, if you have queues backing up, it might be because the service has gotten slow. A lot of these things that you have to worry about. And so these are some of the trade-offs that we have to make. We have to now handle unavailability. These transactions aren't completely free, so we do have to worry about talking to all these additional services now, maybe parallelize some of these calls. Um, we have some ways to, to work around that. Our a APIs are much harder to change now. Um, we can use versioning and some other things, but largely um, they are harder to change. And then we don't have a notion of an atomic deploy anymore. When we, when we deploy a service, we're going to have clients on both sides of the implementation. So we have to worry about supporting both sides of that. Um, Coordinated deploys really work well. And so to recap a little bit, we always want to re be reevaluating our costs and their viability. And I don't mean the financials of things. I'm talking more about the decisions you've made and if they're still the right decisions. Um, are you still okay with the trade-offs you've made? Is something slowing you down? Um, it's, it's important to know what an inflection point looks like and what it means to your software. Um, don't scale before you need to, but be ready for these things. And once you've determined that you need to scale with services, and you can take on the additional complexity, you're going to need an organization that supports building these services. And this could be more than just changing your development structure. This means giving priority to building the tools you need and creating a culture around services. And some things are going to get a lot harder. Um, deployment's going to be more complicated. Um, but that's, or, Deployment, development, all these things are going to be more complicated. Um, but that's OK. Um, we reduce the amount of required effort in some places. And as the system gets larger, it's much more manageable for us. We're also going to need these tools that allow us to keep moving fast. Um, building services can't slow you down. Um, you still have customers. You still need to deliver value to them. And they don't and shouldn't care about any of this stuff. But if things are starting to break, they're going to start caring. And it's going to be on you. And if developers can't build services easily and they're up against a deadline, they might just start adding to the monolith again. Um, it's easier for them and they can just worry about it later. And this is one of the things we talk about a lot at Yammer. And, and I really like this slide. Um, it's be ready to be wrong. You're going to make a lot of mistakes in doing all this. But as long as you're ready to acknowledge and recover from them, um, you're going to be OK. I think we've rewritten our search stack like three different times now. But we've learned a lot about services and what we needed. This is the same in code, too. We look back at the code we wrote, and we want to punch ourselves in the face a lot of the times. Um, decisions, about, decisions about building services and how you organize can be the same way. Um, don't assume the decisions you made yesterday are still the right decisions today. It could be very well, or it very well could be that the, you had the best information and made the best uh, decision at the time, but today that could be different. And this is really hard to do. Like I said, we still have this huge Rails app. We haven't solved that problem yet, but we move towards it. So that's what I've got. Um, again, my name is Brian. I work at Yammer. And thank you, guys. <laughs> so that's kind of a lie. That's not all I have. But that was all I originally had. And I had a couple questions around some of these things, and being I haven't put together a presentation a while, I didn't like want to ruin my flow of things. So I didn't know where to put them, so I just put them at the end. And so this is a point that I wanted to make real quick. This is a question that's come up a couple times. Um, and so I wanted to address it. What should I extract out into a service? And kind of the cop-out answer I've been giving to this is that it depends on your application. Um, but I can share some things that we've seen success with. And so like I said earlier, things that have very little state or don't mutate state turn into relatively good services. Things that are new enough in your application not to be tightly coupled yet tend to be easier to pull out into services. Um, things that don't exist yet, obviously, are things that you can start building services with. And then ultimately, things that are hard to extract but are about to kill you 
are important to extract out. Um, however, not everything works well as a service. Um, we do a lot of A-B testing at Yammer. Um, we saw some performance issues around kind of our experiment framework. We had some tech debt around it. So we thought, sweet, let's build a service out of it. Let's, let's start over. Let's take what we've learned from this and build a service. And so then we thought, no, maybe it's better just to refactor, make what we have better. And so why didn't we turn this into a service? Um, ultimately, the problems we thought we had weren't as bad as we thought. Um, the user data and the experiment service needs, uh, the, the data the experiment service needs is local to our Rails app, and we haven't solved that problem yet. So either we'd have to stop and solve kind of the problem of getting user data to a service, or we'd still have to consult the Rails app or, or Flattery and possibly duplicate some business logic. We weren't ready to go down that path yet. And then we love starting over on new things as developers. Um, it doesn't always make sense. And we found that we can make this better in the place it already was without the need for a service. So kind of the last point here is that, that services can have tech debt as well. Just because you've extracted something out to a service doesn't mean you're home free. Um, you still have to consider all the same things you did about building software, except now you have to worry about more. You have to worry about services morphing to meet new requirements. Um, people that go in and make quick fixes to make a service do this extra thing, you have to be careful this doesn't start to turn into like a monolithic service at that point. Um, and so you still need to make well thought out changes to meet these changing requirements. And, and again, be thinking about tech debt um, to your service infrastructure. And so now let's pretend I have some clue what I'm talking about and we're gonna go back to this last slide again. And, and I just like the slide, so um, I wanted to end on this. So be ready to be wrong. And again, my name is Brad and I work at Yammer. Thanks guys. <laughs>